Okay, so welcome to everyone who is tuning in online and in person here today in the New Story Memorial Food Lab for our Deep Dish Dialogues, which is exploring the beverage industry. So we are going to be having a welcome over the next hour. We have five different drinks that we're going to be walking through, and we're going to be um, looking at the beer industry, the wine industry, and even looking at non-alcoholic cocktails, and I'm having a little bit of a discussion towards the end. So for our event here today, we are in the Mead Stewart Memorial Food Lab at the University of Guelph, and it resides on the ancestral lands of the Ekwandrum people and the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we are also in the area of the Dishwilansia Covenant, which was a pre-colonial agreement which looks at making sure that we are making sure we're using our resources carefully and um, making sure that we have enough to share with everyone around us. Now, for our first speaker that I'd like to invite up, we have Karen, who is from uh, Queen of Craft and Wellington Brewery. We're really excited to have her here today. She's been working at uh, Wellington Brewery for several years and in many different department departments. She's currently the outreach um, manager, and she also was the founder of Queen of Craft in 2013. She has been able to throw many different events aimed at education um, through Queen Craft and even has been able to raise over $65,000 since it was established in 2013. So I'd like to invite Karen to come on out. Hello, everybody. Okay, we're going to get right into this because I feel like I could really talk for a very long time on all of these topics. So, um, Let's start. We're going to start today with how to taste a beer. And you can go online and you can read all of the steps and all of the instructions on how to taste a beer. Um, what I am going to prompt you to do is take the academic out of this and bring <laughs> some mindfulness into it. Because we want to bring mindfulness into all of our tastings um, so that we're actually enjoying the product and we're actually really tasting the nuances of what the brewer um, it wanted you to taste through all of these beers that they've created. We're going to start today with the Hellas Lager. Now the Hellas Lager is, I'm going to ask to see if anybody can guess which one of the beers is the stout and which one is the lager on the table. <laughs> it's the light one. When you are doing a tasting of beers and you're going through possibly a flight if you're at a brewery, you do want to start with the lighter beers so that you can not totally overwhelm your palate and then have lighter things afterwards, obviously. Now, I've put cans on each of your tables, and the reason I put cans on is simply so that you can take a look at this little guide at any point on your can, which will give you some information, and many, many breweries will actually place this guide on their cans so that you know what temperature is the most optimal temperature that you want to serve this beer at, which kind of glassware will fully allow for most of the flavors to come through for this beer, um, and then some other little uh, details about the actual beer and the process of brewing it. So what, how we're going to start today is we're going to start by taking a look at this beer. And you're going to hold it up to the light. Now, what you're looking for here is, number one, the head retention. Now, this beer was poured about 15 minutes ago, so it's a little bit different than what the head retention would be if it was fully and freshly poured. I'm going to show you this a little how-to pour, is that you obviously want to tilt your glass a little bit and you're gonna pour in. Now, based on what you're pouring, if this is a beer that's gonna have a lot of head, you wanna keep the nice angle going. If this is a beer that's a little less carbonated, you're gonna pour right into the center of the glass to create more foam. You wanna have approximately two to three fingers of head at the top of your beer. So I've got a lot of head here. Um, we're gonna take your little, tiny little cute beers here and you're going to notice whether, you're going to notice the color of this. And if you'd like, shout out what color you think this looks like to you. A lot of people, a lot of people will explain. Did someone say straw? 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're a beer person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people will explain a lager as straw-like. Um, and also, we're looking at whether it's opaque or if it's clear. We're looking at you know how it's been filtered. And obviously, this beer has been highly filtered so that we've got a clear, crisp drink here. Um, I'm going to ask you at this point to just agitate the beer a little bit. Now put your hand on top. It is dangerous. And now, before you take your hand off, you're going to wait for a minute. You're going to get your nose really close to it because we're going to go in for the aroma. And after the agitation process, stick your nose right into it. I want to hear what you smell here. Honey? Honey? That's a great one. Is it straw again? <laughs> <laughs> really? Does anybody smell anything like baking bread? Are you getting any of the yeast? Yes. Summer. Summer. Summertime. So what I like to do, because you can go online and find all these descriptors, but what I like to do is, what memory comes into your mind when you take that first sniff? It could be... That's exactly, exactly. Now, a lot of times loggers will remind you of that first sip of beer that you ever took when you were younger um, from that bottle. And, and I really like to be mindful about the memories that you've connected to the aromas that you're getting in the beer. We're going to move on to the tasting. <laughs> that was a long time. I was like, when are we going to do this? Now? So how do you want to actually taste this is when you bring that up to your lips, you're going to bring a little bit into your mouth, and you're going to hold it in your mouth just for a moment. You want to have it um, hit all the different parts of your tongue before you swallow. Anybody have any feedback on what they're tasting here? Light. Light, yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely, we've got a nice light beer here. Are you picking up any sort of, of the esters or any of the bready type notes? Are you getting a sweetness, a hint of honey? A hint of honey, definitely. What we're looking for when we're brewing a lager is something that is crisp. It doesn't have a whole lot of aftertaste. So when you've swallowed that, does it linger a lot in your mouth or does it make you want to take another sip? Go ahead and take another <laughs> This was poured about 15 minutes ago, so ideally it's a little bit colder when you're drinking it to get that real crispness. Um, the last thing we're looking for when we're actually tasting a beer is the mouth feel. So how does it feel in your mouth? Does it feel heavy? Does it feel highly carbonated, really fizzy and bright in your mouth? Are you getting... Um, a lot of aftertaste, is there a dryness to it afterwards? So these are all things that for every single person who has a different mouth, different tongue, different palate, and different mind, you're all going to have slightly different experiences with every single beer that you taste. What I love about beer is that there are so many different styles to experience. So I guarantee that I can find you, if you're not a beer lover, a beer that you love. We're going to move on from the Hellas Lager right on to the Chocolate Milk Stout. Now one thing, when we're going to do the same thing, but I'm not going to go as in-depth when we're tasting this one, but I am going to talk a little bit about SRM, which is on the side of the can, and this is an indication of color. Now it goes from 0 to 60, this is a 2, and this is a 40. I kind of think this should be a little bit higher. If <laughs> but there are beers that are darker than this. Now let's do the same kind of thing. We're going to take a look. Obviously, an opaque beer that you cannot see through. Beautiful, beautiful color here. And let's give this one another little agitation. If you check on the side of this can, this is meant to be served at a slightly higher temperature so that we're releasing a little more of the flavors. Give it a nice sniff. Mm, what do you smell here? 
Coffee, chocolate. Beautiful. Coffee and chocolate for sure. In most of treacle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is really good. Anybody smelling any cocoa or toffee? Molasses. Ooh, that's a good one. Lovely. And there is a little bit of smokiness. I will tell you one story. When I was in the tap room, I've been working at the brewery for 12 years now, and I started off in the tap room. I had a woman that came in who was 90 years old. I'd never tried a stout before. And so I gave her a little stout. She took a sip of it, and she said, I'm getting smoked salmon. And so now whenever I take a sip of a stout, I really pick up on, because I thought that was such a unique way to describe what she was experiencing. Whenever I take a sip of a stout, I get a little bit of that smokiness. And I think about salmon, and then I'm like, hmm. Not sure about the salmon part, but definitely the smoky part. So from here, let's once again, let this settle in your mouth for a moment, and then swallow. Can you come back at me with anything that you're experiencing on your palate? What you're tasting, what, you're, what your taste buds are picking up on with this beer? Not far from licorice. Anise, exactly. Yes. I, I just get like, it's like a chocolate milkshake. <laughs> are we picking up the cocoa? So, yeah. Okay, so the unique thing about this, which I wanted to really have these two different experiences for you, this is a very pure beer that is brewed with four basic ingredients of beer. Now, this beer, we've ha we have some adjuncts. So, adjuncts are anything you're going to add to the basic four ingredients of beer to heighten or create another, another flavor. Now, in this beer, we have added cocoa, cocoa powder, in the second boil of the brewing process of this beer. But also, at the end of this beer, we add a little bit of lactose. Now, what lactose does in a beer is it imparts a very creamy mouthfeel. So let's take another sip and talk about how it feels in your mouth. There's a little bit of that coating. You're right. It's a thicker experience in your mouth. Some people call this a chunky beer, you know? It's almost like you could drink this beer for lunch. <laughs> I've done that before. <laughs> um, so, so this beer actually is an incredible beer to pair with sweet things, but also so many cheeses complement this beer. Um, any kind of creamy cheese, even a sharp, sharp, old, old cheddar will taste great. Sometimes, you know, we have complementary pairings and sometimes we have contrasting pairings. Um, this beer is really easy to pair with lots of things. I also just did make a chocolate cake with this as well. <laughs> so, how are we doing for time here? Yes, yeah, so we have like about four more minutes. Oh, jeez. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what I'm really here to talk about, and I'm, I'm glad that I got to bring you through the how to taste mindfully because, you know, moving forward and especially during the holidays, um, when you're surrounded by people, sometimes you can just drink your drinks very quickly. Um, maybe because you're not feeling comfortable, or you're anxious, or uh, it's just something that I think a lot of us are prone to doing. So take a few moments when you're in that situation to really appreciate and you know experience everything that that drink has to offer. I am here because 10 years ago, I had an idea that um, you know, it was a real dude's world in beer 10 years ago. And there were not a lot of venues for women to actually learn and feel really comfortable in those spaces. Things have changed a lot over the past decade, but that's because there are a lot of people at the forefront of beer, a lot of women at the forefront who are really pushing the envelope on making it a more inclusive environment for everybody. Um, I started something called Queen of Craft, where our mandate was to have women at the helm of all of the educating, and then to create a very safe space for women and allies to come and learn about beer. So 
We also decided that at that point we were going to see and pitch this to Wellington to see if we could have 100% of all of our profits from everything go back to Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis. And thankfully, they said yes to this. And so for the past 10 years, that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been doing is putting on programming um, for people in the community. We often go to cities as well. Um, and then 100% of everything we do uh, goes back to uh, the organization. Um, That's incredible. Yeah. So, so sometimes people are wondering who, who's involved, who's, who's involved in the planning and, and how can other people get involved? So basically we usually do every Friday in March, we'll do at 10C downtown Guelph. Um, and we have myself sort of at the center. I'm the nucleus of the atom. I, I don't know if there's any science people in here. Hopefully that's <laughs> right. Uh, and then I have a crew of about 10 very devoted um, women who are volunteer most of their time to come and help out with all of the planning. And every time we have a very different, unique theme, we have done everything from going absolutely nerdy into the chemistry of yeast and yeast in different beers, and we will spend three hours talking about yeast. Um, to uh, you know, a night where we have we paired up with the women wrestlers in Ontario, and actually had a huge women's wrestling event where we had different women go to different breweries and brew a collab beer with those breweries, and then we created teams where they came and we had a huge wrestling. Really super fun That's event. So much fun. So, <laughs> kind of all over the map with what we do, um, but we try to balance all of the really educational stuff with a lot of very fun stuff. Um, we do have a beer release happening this Friday at Wellington Brewery if anybody would like to come. Um, 50 cents of each can and pint are donated to Wellington Women in Texas, and we actually bring a golden ale with sumac. So, we will be doing a nice discussion on sumac. And we'll be playing a little bit of Jeopardy, and then we'll be having a party with a DJ. So um, free, to, free to come. And we've got lots of local people that have offered donations, which we have definitely leaned into, is um, all the support we've had from local people, local businesses, and other Ontario craft breweries who have helped us out a lot with donating products so that we can create more of a donation every year to, to the charity. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for filling us all in. Yeah, my Looking pleasure. Forward to, to chatting with you again at yeah. the end. More, Sounds good. More about inclusivity wow. and, and all the different things that, that you've been doing to make, make the beer industry more welcoming. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everyone. <laughs> sure. So um, one other thing as well too, if you do still have your samples there, we do have a piece of chocolate and some pretzels, if you wanted to try that and see if that makes any difference in the taste, or if you're just hungry and you want to the weight. So just a heads up about that. But we are going to segue now into wine. And so we have a special, another special guest, Beverly Crandall. And so she is a sommelier. But she's also um, one of the founders of the Ampli, which is going to be telling us a little bit more about that. Yeah. And we're going to have her here today. Thank yeah. you for having me, you guys. Can you start first talking about the Nike Nation? Yeah. Oh, what, what is it? Oh, for us, yes, see, perfect. I was going to say, please, if you have the pretzel, eat a pretzel before we jump into the wine. <laughs> Jenna, <laughs> please, please. Awesome. Um, so the Equity is a not-for-profit, a Canadian not-for-profit, and what we do is we support BIPOC people in Canada who are interested in wine and spirits and beer, all of it. Um, so if they're looking for mentorship or they're looking for scholarships, we provide that. We've raised, uh, we were formed in 2020 after the reckoning, um, and we've raised about $80,000 so far uh, and have given away about $40,000 in scholarship. So... <laughs> You know, I always say that regardless of the industry that you are in, cognitive diversity is so important to move the industry forward, or else you're going to stay stagnant. Because our, our culture changes, our, our, our demographics change in our, in our country, and if it's the same people sitting around the table making decisions, 
that's kind of stale. You're not going to be able to relate to the new demographic that's coming up, the new consumers that are coming up. So, Ben Equity is all about that. It's fantastic. And yeah. You're, you're very modest, too, <laughs> about your work, because everyone, everyone across Canada has been following along with what you've been doing and really been kind of leading the charge. And yeah, it's fun. Work. It's fun in a way that it's rewarding. Um, now we support people like all across Canada, from the East, we've got people in Quebec, we've got people in BC, obviously Ontario, and now, uh, happily, Alberta is the last area we've been able to affect. We've got some members from Alberta. Um, I say it's fun and it's rewarding because when someone goes through a mentorship period or they've gotten a scholarship and they've gone to class and they pass with distinguished honors and so on, and they're just so happy, and then they've got a career that they're now forging ahead in, and I think that's wonderful. We're seeing a lot of people who applied for scholarship just to get started, level one wines and so on. Now they're here going, I want to go for my certified sommelier or master's or diploma, and they're asking for money for that. So it's working in terms of we're seeing people, people of color, graduating, moving up this process. So I'm hopeful that in 10 years from now, when we sit around an executive table in the wine industry, that we'll see Canada truly represented, right? What Canada really looks like. So, yeah. I look forward to that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's needed. Yes, sure. absolutely. So should we jump into yeah. the wines now? Yeah, let's get started. <laughs> so, um, yes, I am a certified sommelier. What that just means is I drink more wine than all of you, probably. <laughs> um, that really is all it means. Um, but in addition to being one of the founding members of Vinequity, I also run um, a group called Spice Food and Wine Group. And... I did that because going through wine education and formal education to become certified, we would always talk about the wines clearly, but also talk about pairings. Because one of the things that you're supposed to be able to do when you graduate is work at a restaurant. And if someone is going to have the beef wellington, be able to suggest a wine that would go wonderfully with that. Uh, and when you're going for certification and you're being tested, they ask you, hey, you have a Beaujolais, what dish are you going to put with that? And I would always in class want to say, well, oh, I pair Beaujolais all the time with like a pepper pot or a pelau, which are Caribbean dishes. And the instructor would be like, oh, you can't say that. You lose. You not get that mark. And I thought that was so weird. Like, I mean, we're such a cosmopolitan province, specifically, especially growing up in, living in Toronto, sorry. Like, you can't walk two blocks and not find a restaurant that's like Thai or Vietnamese or whatever. And the fact that I have to say, but I'm going to pair this Beaujolais with a pork chop. I mean, I think it's very limiting. So from that, I created the Spice Food and Wine Group. And what we do is a series of events. We talk about wine pairing and how to taste wine and all those fundamentals. But the more exciting work that we do is we take wine and we pair it with ethnic food um, just to change the narrative. You know, I always say that when you're doing food and wine pairing, you're pairing flavor compounds and molecules. And flavor compounds and molecules don't have an ethnicity, a race, a cuisine that they're aligned with. It's just science. And so if we get rid of the story that says, oh, well, you know what, if you're going to have curries, you could only have that with a Riesling from Germany with the residual sugar. That's what you have. I mean, that, that's fine. If you don't like meat, and someone says you can only have one grape from one place, with that kind of sugar, I mean, Oh, I'm not saying that. <laughs> so, it's the narrative and letting people do their own exploration when it comes to food and wine pairing. And so that's what we do with Spice Food and Wine Group. And we're going to do something like that here today. Um, I'm going to walk you through high level um, how I do food and wine pairing when we're doing events or festivals and that type of thing. Um, you won't be a pro, but you'll know enough to go home and be dangerous. Um, so I'll be Are there any wine lovers in here, first of all? Oh, look at that. Well, this is interesting. Um, anybody geek out over food and wine pairing? Or you're like, I'm just going to drink this one. Uh -huh. All right, after my own heart. Uh, there are people who say, listen, it's master psalm and masters of wine. So not just lay folk walking around, the masters in the space. They say food and wine pairing is such a gimmick. They say, nope. Take your favorite dish and pour a glass of wine and just drink it and you're going to be fine. And I think that's okay if you want some vino to wash down what you're eating. But I feel that if you're going to spend that much time putting together a wonderful dish and friends are coming over and you're sitting down, you don't just want to be drinking. You want to make wow moments on the palate. And that's what I always talk about. You know, when I first got into food and wine, 
Oh, wine, I should say. I've been eating food for quite some time. When I first got into wine, it was through a client who is just he and I. And at dinner, he said, okay, I want to order two bottles of wine. And I thought, this is ridiculous. It's kind of, you know. Plus, I was king. He was my client. I was like, this is, come on. So I was like, no, we're going to get this. He's from California. We're going to get this lovely California Oki Chardonnay to go with this. And then we're going to get this Cabernet Sauvignon to go with that. I was like, okay, fine. I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, big client. I don't want to upset him. And then, but that night, I understood how the food transformed the wine and the wine transformed the food. And that's when I was like, whoa. Everybody, regardless of your cuisine, should have this experience. And I remember when I learned this from my client, like I would go home and on the weekends, we'd have big family dinners and we'd cook our cultural food. For some reason, I never thought that I could bring the wine and pair it with like a dish my mom was making. I just thought the two worlds were different because that's how I always saw it. Right, like you look at advertisements, you don't see people of color saying, I'm going to have this lovely summer, y'all. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Spice Through the Wine Group, for me, is about changing the narrative. It is about diversity and inclusivity. Because when we have these events, people often ask, well, why haven't we done this before? And then we have some, could be difficult conversations, but with wine in hand, it's okay, where we talk about the spice route the slave trade, and how people were seen as commodities just like the wine. So they'd come from Bordeaux, and I love wine from Bordeaux, but I have to separate the two. They come from Bordeaux with all this wine, and they'd be like, well, we've got to put the slaves in, so move the wine out of the hall, la la la. So you would hear yourself being referred to just like a commodity. So it's not, you would see it as something for them and not for me. So Spice Food and Wine Group is about changing that narrative. That's enough of that. We're going to go now into how I go about pairing. As I said, you're pairing flavor compounds and molecules such as science. So there's a couple of things that I do. Um, first of all, you've got on your plate uh, curry chickpeas, which uh, where I'm from, we call it curry chana. And I picked that because, um, I mean, if I was going to make curry for myself, it'd be like some sort of protein, like beef would be in there. I'm a big meat eater. But anyhow, so it's all vegetarian, but I picked that because it's, it's something that we all know, and it's something that many different countries make, even though slightly different, so it's a, it's a common thing. Um, but this is a dish where people would say, if you're gonna have curry, you need to have that with a, a German Riesling, because the acidity and the residual sugar is gonna be fine, because the spice is too spicy, and blah, blah, blah. But the people who are writing that narrative have not grown up eating curry. They don't really understand the flavor compounds and all that stuff, or have they experimented with it. And so we're going to do that today. One wine that you have is a traditional wine. It's like a, a Riesling from Germany, Dr. Lucen Riesling. And the second wine you have is the wine, when I tell you what it is, you're going to be like, this woman is crazy. This is ridiculous. <laughs> it is a Cabernet Sauvignon from South Africa. Like It's like total different end of the spectrum. And everything people would say you should not do with curry. And I remember I did this once at a dinner where I had a master psalm, and there was someone who was very, um, was very big up in the, uh, in the government in terms of food and wine regulation, and they saw me pulling this out. We were doing a curry lamb at the dinner, and I pulled out a Cabernet Sauvignon from South Africa, and I saw them go, so I, I know they're like, this child is crazy. Are you sure she's just on the But, so what I do when I'm looking at food and wine pairing, first thing is I let the food take the lead. A lot of times when I'm doing dinners with chefs, they will say, well, Beverly, what wine are you serving? Because I'll make a dish to go with that. And I'm like, hell no. I know you chefs. Like if a dish is like supposed to be one way, like it's a beef wellington, you as a chef, they're going to want to like put their own little touches in there. And so all of a sudden it doesn't taste the way I would expect it to taste. So I like the food drive what I'm going to do with the wine. And then I also let the dominant flavors in the food drive what I'm going to do. A lot of times people will look at a dish and say, oh, it, there's, there's steak in this. So we're going to go with a very tannic red wine to help break down the fat in the steak. It's going to be wonderful. But if that steak has got some heat, it was well seasoned, you're probably not going to go with that tannic red. You may want to go with a lighter red, like a Cabernet Franc or a Pinot Noir. So it's always the dominant flavor in the dish that I go with. I don't care what the protein is because I've done pairing like steak with a white wine mm -hmm. and pairing fish with a red wine. So curry. Does anybody know what's in curry powder? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's like a whole bunch of things. It's like cumin, it's turmeric. But the most important thing that I want to remember in curry powder is that it also has clove, allspice, okay. and nutmeg. Okay? Um, there is a masala that's in this, which itself has a bit of heat. It's not, to me, I don't think it's like hot heat, but some, if you don't eat spice a lot, might think it is. So what I want to do first is tackle the curry, chickpeas, with the Riesling. Um, what I'd like you to do is take a sip of the Riesling first. 
And it's acknowledged what it tastes like. It's like it's Riesling. High acid, which I love in my wine, especially <laughs> if I'm eating. Um, and residual sugar, you get that? It's nice. It's, it's typical, traditional. If I'm going to blind you on something, this is what I'm going to serve you. <laughs> now, I'd like you to go and have some of the curry chickpeas. Just a little bit. And with that still in your mouth, Drink some of the reason again. And what I'd like you to tell me is if the wine has changed any, or did the wine change the chickpeas when you had it, the texture, the feel? Everything's changed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. Um, Riesling is perfect for something like this because of its acidity, right? Mm. Uh, so when I'm also pairing food with wine, the other thing I look for is the weight and texture. That's going to be important if you're pairing it with like fried chicken, which I don't have. I'm sorry, I didn't bring fried chicken. But if you have fried chicken, you want to look to have, find something to pair that texture, that fried skin, to break that down on the palate. Um, but here, the acidity is going to be lovely with the chickpeas because it can be thick and it's going to soften that on the palate. Uh, and then, of course, you've got that residual sugar. So if you did get a hint of spice, that RS is going to tackle that, which is why people are like, oh, you should just always just drink Riesling with mm -hmm. your stuff. Was that okay? Yeah. that appearing? Yeah, yeah? Did you guys like this one? Yeah, it's good. Uh, anybody notice anything that they want to talk about in terms of how the food changed the wine or the wine changed the food? I noticed more nutmeg with the Riesling. It brought out more of the sweetness from the curry that yeah. probably would have picked up. Yeah. Anybody else? Less intense, but longer. Yeah, longer finish. Yeah, yep. And that will often happen. Um, sometimes people get surprised when I take like, a spicy dish and I pair it with a lighter red. I do that because what happens with that pepper, it takes the red fruit in that wine and it, it okay. propels it even more so and it starts to linger. So there's some really interesting things that you can do when you start to experiment. Now, I'm going to ask you guys to take a sip of the Cabernet Sauvignon. So, um, remember I mentioned that curry has allspice, clove, and nutmeg. So here what I'm doing is a congruent pairing because this Cabernet Sauvignon has seen some time with oak. And oak imparts flavor compounds into the wine, and those flavor compounds can be vanilla, clove, allspice, nutmeg, the same thing in curry. So what I was drawing on here with this dish is saying, I'm gonna take the same sameness and have that make a wow moment in your mouth and change things. So that's why I went with a Cabernet Sauvignon, which no one ever does for curry. But now you know if you've got a Cabernet Sauvignon that's got some time in oak, it's gonna be lovely. Well, you should try it first. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> All right, so now go ahead, have some of the chickpeas. With it still in your mouth, like chew it a little bit. And with it still in your mouth, go back to the Cabernet Sauvignon. And just watch how that clove, nutmeg, allspice, like starts to dance. Mm -hmm. Also, this Cabernet Sauvignon does have a sense of like a medium, medium plus acidity, which is also wonderful. You've got that acidity there for your for your food. Any comments on that? That experience? <laughs> So this is why the master song was like, this woman has lost her mind, and we're going to take it. <laughs> but you know, if you just experiment and look at what is in the wine and what's happened in the wine, and plus, being from South Africa, you know that it's warmer there. So the grapes are going to have a bit more of a riper mouth feel, which gives you like fake residual sugar. It's not really that residual sugar, it's just the ripeness of the fruit, which also helps with spice. So, um, show of hands, did you like the Riesling pairing better? The Cabernet Sauvignon, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> and that, that was all I wanted to share in terms of food and wine pairing, and also the fact of acidity. Like, if ever you're with me at an event, and you're like, this woman has said acidity like a thousand times, because it is so important. Acidity is the backbone of a wine, and especially when you're doing food and wine pairing, if you mm -hmm. don't have that, the whole meal just falls flat, as far as I'm concerned. Cabernet Sauvignon tends to be harsher as it ages. You, would you recommend a younger Cabernet Sauvignon as opposed to like a 10 year old Cabernet? Actually, the tannins, depending on if it's cool climate Cabernet Sauvignon, the tannins will actually calm down. Um, and so there's a point there where the tannins calm and the fruit kind of goes up. So if you had um, a left bank Bordeaux blend, 
Yeah. I would tell you in five years, open that and have it with that. Because the tannins would have come down just a little bit. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. So we've run through our time here. Okay, well then. <laughs> <laughs> non-alcoholic cocktail. So one of the biggest trends sort of in the cocktail industry in the last sort of two, three years has been low ABV, which is alcohol by volume, or non-alcoholic cocktails. Um, And so what we've seen come up, which is really great, um, are what are known as non-alcoholic distillates. So they're like a non-alcoholic gin or rum or tequila things like that. The one I'm using today is Seedlip. So Seedlip was kind of the pioneer of this movement. Uh, Came out of the UK from a guy that was a bartender and a farmer, and he was a cocktail nerd, and he (laughs) was just researching stuff and kind of came across um, old apothecary books that had non-alcoholic distillates in it, and he sort of thought, hey, let me try uh, try that out. Um, And also, it was because he was tired of kind of getting the... Shirley Temples of the world yes. when you go to get a non-alcoholic drink. So he wanted to kind of do something a little different. So Seedlip is started in about 2015. Since then, there's been a couple other companies that have come up. Uh, another one from the UK is Liars, and they do like a whole range. They do rum, a tequila. They do kind of everything that you could ever want sort of thing. Um, Seedlip itself kind of just stuck to different sort of botanicals and, and flavors in their different styles. They have three main styles. The one I'm using today is their newest one that came out. It's called Grove 42. So it's sort of um, a little bit of like a, almost like a curacao a little bit, but with a bit more of an herbaly kind of taste to it. And to interrupt you, yeah. where can people find Seedlip if they've never heard of it before? Yeah, yes. so Seedlip, I believe you can get it market fresh in Guelph. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, you to so I'm just like, I'm hoping you can still get it there. Um, you can also, because it's a non-alcoholic, you can order it online. So you can actually get it, not that I want to plug this, but like you could get it through Amazon, theoretically. Um, but also through their websites as well. They often do a lot of delivery as well through that. Um, and there's also two really good websites that I am going to plug that are Canadian um, bartending websites. So there's the Crafty Bartender and Cocktail Emporium as well. And they tend to sell a lot of this stuff as well. And they also sell all this equipment too, if you want to start your own bar at home. Um, cool. Yeah, so the cocktail I'm making today um, is called, it's one we have at the restaurant, and um, it's called the Mai Tai. Um, so it's based on a Mai Tai, which is a traditional tiki cocktail. Um, and uh, we, we exclusively right now work with seed lips, so that's why I went with the, the orange, orangey sort of flavored seed lip because it kind of plays on that kind of orange flavor and everything that exists in that drink already. Um, So what, it's a really simple drink to make. So we just do basically an ounce of everything. So we're gonna do, um, we do an ounce of the seed lip. Um, I can let you guys smell it later. It's, uh, It's got a bit, yeah, it's kind of like a gin. It doesn't have any juniper in it, so you wouldn't really call it a gin. Um, but uh, from like our perspective, you would probably lean towards more feeling like these were sort of flavored gins. And it like has that same kind of mouth feel. It has, yeah, a very similar mouth feel. You guys can like smell and taste a little bit if you want to want to later. Um, yeah, so 
it would basically, basically gin is a flavored vodka. Um, and this is essentially a non-alcoholic flavored vodka. So yeah, it would, yeah, basically be like a gin. Um, and I'm gonna do, so when I bartend at home or at the bar, I try to use fresh um, as possible on my citrus, just to avoid kind of that um, souring that happens when it's sitting out a little bit longer. Um, there's a lot of different theories on this now. Some people say an hour is the perfect amount of time to wait for your citrus. Some people, it's all over the place. Um, this is the way I was trained and I kind of, I've tried other ways and this is the way I like to do it, so. Um, this is uh, orgette syrup. So orgette syrup, is almond based. We make our own at the Badly. It's not super easy to come by in Ontario. That's kind of one of the biggest challenges about being a bartender in Ontario, is things aren't super accessible as they are in the rest of the world. Um, and so we make our own. You can buy it uh, through those websites mm -hmm. we talked about. Um, what kind of um, ingredients are in it if people are trying to figure out at home? To how, what do I put in mind that we make? Yeah, yeah. so we, I, I found a sheet online. So you used to have to uh, take the almonds, grind them down, basically make your own almond milk um, and then I was researching because that takes forever and it's not very fun and I've done that before um, so we just start with almond milk to start with okay. so we basically make kind of a simple syrup or a rich syrup with almond milk uh, then we add a bit of almond extract a little bit of rose water a little bit of orange flower water as well and then that's how we get our beautiful orgette syrup and if you want, I can send you recipes and stuff if people want. <laughs> um, so we're going to do an ounce of that. I get the limit. And then the last thing, I just add a little bit of orange juice just to give it a bit of color and to kind of pick on the orange flavors a little bit. Perfect. Sorry for my meter containers, if you work in the industry. <laughs> Has anyone seen The Bear? Have you seen that yes, show? Yes. There's a part where he's drinking water out of a liter container. And, like, and I was like, every day in they, know. <laughs> they know. <laughs> so you're going to shake. And we're going to take this cocktail because we want a good dilution on it. We want a bit of that um, aeration as well so it doesn't come off too sweet. Um, and then we're going to serve it over crushed ice. So what the, why do we use crushed ice over regular ice? Um, it's, well, so for the Mai Tai, it's traditional. Yes. Um, <laughs> crushed ice is, it uh, kind of freezes it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually kind of get less dilution happening because the more ice you have, the less dilution you have. That's a common misconception with people when they're like, I don't want a lot of ice in my drink because I don't want a lot of dilution. <laughs> if you only put two cubes in, they're going to melt faster than if you have 20 cubes in there because ice keeps ice cold, right? So it, it does that. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna do that. It's true. <laughs> Everyone's like, I'm blowing people's minds right now. <laughs> um, okay, so the big, the big reveal, the big pour. The big pour. So we're gonna pour into the cup there. And then what's really cool about a Mai Tai, which is why I always like doing it when I'm training people and stuff as well, is it, it kind of emphasizes. Um, the power of a garnish. So the traditional Mai Tai, as well as this Mai Tai that we've created, um, <laughs> MY, is what we, um, uses uh, the mint. And the mint, there's actually no mint in the drink. But when you sip it, that's why it kind of works with your samples, and it might not completely, because I don't have a straw for you guys. But um, when you do the cocktail garnish, you want to put the mint right next to the straw, so that when the guest is sipping it, what's gonna happen is you're gonna smell the mint. I'm actually just gonna cut this straw shorter. Um, because I'm sure you guys were talking about that with beer and wine as well. You taste with your nose as well as your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna smell the mint and you actually get the, then the mint flavor coming through, which is really great. And then because it's a tiki cocktail, we like to do some fun stuff at the bar. So we do these little dehydrated limes that we've colored fun colors. Um, <laughs> and that's usually what we got to slap that guy with there. So then that is a Mai Tai, non-alcoholic Mai Tai. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you guys want to try the ones you have, I'd give them just a little swirl because I made them a little while ago um, just to let everything kind of mix back together. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you don't have the crushed ice, so you don't have like the really chillness to it, but it gives you an idea of the flavors that come across. And you have, well, I think it become more common for people to, to be looking for 
Yeah, yeah well, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Is that becoming more of a trend? Are you seeing? It's definitely a trend, and it's definitely if you go into bars now, there's often a, a full section of the bar menu that's dedicated to that, to low ABV and non-alcoholic. Um, and it's a trend right across the board as well. Like I'm sure Karen can talk about that a little bit as well. Like it's coming, and beers, non-alcoholic beers are becoming more popular. Um, I haven't noticed wines so much, but yeah, it's it's definitely a, it's definitely a big trend mm -hmm. to the point that there's a huge cocktail competition every year called Diageo World. Class, mm -hmm. um, and they usually, in their sort of regional competitions, they kind of focus on the trends that are happening. And yeah. last year, wait, it's 2022, yeah, so 2020, I guess it was 2022 okay. actually. Um, <laughs> for that year, one of the main focuses they had for their bartenders was to focus on low ABV and non alcoholic drinks, which mm -hmm. shows you that, like, globally, it's actually a thing that's that's on the rise. That's yeah. great. And I think there's so much opportunity out there to make really great tasting drinks and you don't necessarily always, always Yeah, yeah. It is fun. It's fun to have the option to kind of now start to mimic some classics and come up with fun uh, non-alcoholic drinks whereas before we were kind of stuck with the Shirley Temples yeah. or the those kind of like just sugar and juice and you know what you had that you could work with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick minute just to kind of clean up a little bit and then we're gonna have a discussion with all three of our panel speakers. So welcome back everyone. Uh, I'm excited here. We're going to have a discussion here with our three experts, and they all have organizations that have really focused on making the industry more inclusive. And I wanted to have, it would be a bit of a short conversation, um, just about the different things that, that they're finding in the industry. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, first of all, if we just go down the line, maybe sure. we'll start off on, on the positives, because there's a lot of really great things about this industry. I'm wondering if each of you can tell me uh, a little bit about what it is that you love working in your industry. Um, so I'll start with you, Beverly. Yeah, I, I love stories. Um, and doing what we do in serving the public in such a way with, with wine and food and so on, you get to meet people and you get to have really interesting conversations and you get to meet so many different people. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's like everyday education. Like you just learn so much about places, people, things when you do mm -hmm. that. So that to me is a highlight of this space. I think what I like most about the beer industry, the craft beer industry specifically in Ontario right now, is that there are a lot of breweries and people who are really pushing the agenda of diversity and inclusion and really trying to make a difference in, like on a whole. Um, so you'll see lots of charitable beers, donations to organizations doing great things, and you'll see a lot of people calling out sh shitty behaviors <laughs> in the hospitality yeah. industry as a whole. So there's a lot of accountability that's happening right now, and um, it's, it's very refreshing to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I would say connection as well, which mm -hmm. kind of goes with stories. It's definitely as a bartender, I get to connect with a lot of people, um, both from staff that I still know years later, um, <laughs> <laughs> to, <laughs> and, um, and customers and, and having those regulars and knowing their life stories and things like that is something that's really rewarding in this industry. You don't get it in every industry. Um, and then it's been really, yeah, really rewarding to see kind of like a diversity change that's happening. I know specifically in Alora where I am now, that did come mainly out of the beer industry because it yeah. started sort of with the brewery in Alora and it, it kind of grew into the whole industry in, in the town, which is pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think so much, so I have a background working in restaurants and so much we've kept under wraps, like we haven't been able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the pandemic we saw mm -hmm. was a big kind of reckoning. Um, everyone, everyone spoke up. There was a lot of media attention as well. Um, and it's trying to figure out how, how do we actually create change? And so I know, um, like you, you have organizations that, that are trying to push change forward. Do you think that's, that's the way forward to make the beverage industry and the food service industry more equitable and inclusive? Or are there other things that you, it's a big question. Are there things, <laughs> things that you think need to happen um, and we need to see? Um, maybe I'll do you, do you want the other side of the story. <laughs> I would say, you know, I, education is a huge thing. Um, mm -hmm. And even if I just kind of apply it to my bartending career, um, 
even just that's kind of how I was trained from the start as well because I kind of came about right when the cocktail revolution was happening and um, a lot of people still wanted those like Long Island iced teas and and things like that (laughs) and you had to kind of educate the customer base um, in a nice way like not tell people (laughs) the drinks they want are crap but um, (laughs) um, kind of like you know finding connections with people and finding ways to be like hey do you want to try this rum there's this really cool Mm -hmm. rum here's a really great cocktail I can make with it and even tying into that like one of the things I used to get more back then which is nice that it doesn't happen so much now is I used to get guys coming up going I want a manly drink Um, and they'd be really upset if I served it to them in a coupe glass which is like those little like champagne glasses or in a martini glass or anything with a stem they'd kind of roll their eyes at me and it just really came about we had a cocktail at the one bar that I first worked at that was like this Manhattan that had absinthe and all this stuff is straight booze. It is like if you were quote unquote having a manly drink, it's a manly drink. Um, although I love it, so I call it a lady drink. <laughs> um, but you know, like we would sort of uh, you know talk to people and be like, so when you say manly drink, what do you what do you mean by that? And what are you what are you looking for? And and that's what bartenders should do on a regular anyway. When you're going up to order a drink, they should be asking you sort of like what flavors do you like, what kind of things, because they're trying to find something that's going to fit your palate. Um, but yeah, that was kind of how we started maybe making a little bit of a difference in that education. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for me also, just personally, it's been about um, giving people opportunities. So because I've had the option to, or the opportunity to be on management teams for a lot of restaurants and be part mm-hmm. of the hiring team, it's, it's finding people that maybe just want that chance that maybe you've never gotten that chance before um, and not looking for what quote unquote would be the stereotypical bartender, um, looking for someone that's just really interested in the industry and really wants to learn more about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I can I can tag along on that final comment in that um, just when I started doing the hiring of our event staff, uh, before that it was done in a way that was very physically based. It was very much who is going to be the front face that will represent this concept of beer um, that we think people will like. And as soon as I kind of stepped into that role. Um, I just hired all my friends and all these beer-loving people, and uh, and I, I feel like things really started to shift at that point where we had so many knowledgeable people who were really in love with the product and in love with talking about it, and I think that was uh, a really important change and shift. Um, I also feel like I just want to grab this one can. I'm going to be really brief about this, but one of the, my favorite projects, this is, so I do community outreach, so I look for organizations and causes that we can do charity beers for. And one of my favorite and um, basically most controversial labels we've done and beers we've done is called Nothing Civil. And this is a beer that we did two years ago, about a year and a half ago. And this beer was spearheaded by three black women in the industry that are just absolute powerhouses. And one of which uh, is named Truth Is, who's a spoken word artist. So the poem is here on the front. And uh, donations all went to Black Lives Matter Canada. And so keeping that alive, that spirit alive in all the projects we look for, we look for what's happening currently, and we look for how we can um, lend a hand and raise awareness, number one, because we have a platform, so mm-hmm. we can raise awareness. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can do as a, as a business. Well said. And Beverly, what, what is your opinion? I, I think it's great that there are organizations um, like what we represent or founders of to champion the cause. But I think the biggest thing is people who are pillars or have positions of power in the industry to be okay with being vulnerable Mm. and be okay with saying I don't know and educate themselves. I say that because we see people who come up the ranks through mentorship and education and I'm like this person of color, Bob, is going to be so ideal in that role over there. Bob is so talented but for some reason Bob still feels it may not be a welcoming space. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have to support the applicants that are going in there, but there's a whole bunch of education Mm -hmm. that needs to happen in the actual industry, in the institution. Um, So people understand things like unconscious bias. We all have it, Mm -hmm. right? Like it's not like black people, we we all have it. Mm -hmm. Um, But some people 
Oh, well, really? I don't have that. But just like education, allowing yourself to be vulnerable and just like truly understand and building safe spaces. Um, I think there's only so much that we in our organization can do to build awareness, but if we internally aren't willing to change or accept or be vulnerable, it's, it, it's going to be It's hard. going nowhere. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're absolutely right about that. And I, I like all three of you um, mentioned the, the role of education mm-hmm. and awareness, but it, again, it is being able to actually listen and actually act um, and it's it's a lot more than just having a couple organizations. Yeah. It takes an entire entire industry to create that action. Yeah. So we only have have a couple minutes left. Um, so just in in wrapping up, I'm wondering if each of you could just share where people could find more information about the work that you're doing. Um, so Beverly, I'll start off with you. Can yep. You- Fill, fill people in. <laughs> uh, so vinequity.ca is our website. Um, vin like wine equity. That's it. Uh, and that's where you'll hear more about Vinequity. And if ever you are interested in doing some really neat food and wine pairing events, spicefoodandwine.com um, is uh, where you find all my personal events. That's great. Karen? Um, so we have uh, some Instagram accounts and little social media accounts, Queen of Craft. If you uh, look for that, search for that, Queen of Craft Beer is where you're going to get the most um, detailed information about all of our upcoming events and what we're doing. Great. Uh, for me, I don't have an organization. I've worked with Queen of Craft before. Mm-hmm. I've worked with lots yep. of uh, different groups. But if you ever want to just talk cocktails or talk the industry, um, the easiest way to get in touch with me is through my work Instagram, which is at County Cocktails. So like Wellington County, like County Cocktails. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a funny story about that because it was small town cocktails, and then that shortened very <laughs> inappropriately <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, okay, we're changing that name. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so at County Cocktails. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm always willing to, to meet up with people and talk to people. And then I'm also in Alora at the Badly, which is a new restaurant that just opened. And I'm pretty much there every day we're open. So um, if you want to come by and just have a drink and, and chat, that works as well. That's great. So thank you, Katie, Karen, you for and Beverly yeah. for, for coming here, being a part of this. This was so much fun. We all learned a lot of little little things. I wish we had longer. Like uh, the ice. Like the, the ice color. That, that, yeah. that was mind blowing. That was mind blowing. And so I also just in wrapping up, I want to let you know if you really enjoyed learning about different drinks, the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management actually does organize different classes and certificates. So if you're looking to learn more, um, you can visit uofguelph.ca slash hftm slash wset and you can find out about that and then again i want to just reiterate this was part of our deep dish dialogue series this was our ninth one of the year Uh, it's been a lot of fun to put on and we're going to be carrying it forward in 2023 so we look forward to seeing you there it's a collaboration between the school of hospitality food and tourism management and the gordon s lang school of business and the Errol Food Institute at the University of Guelph. So thank you for for being a part of this today, and I hope everyone has a great holiday season, and we'll see you in 2023.